In February 2008, 24-year-old real estate agent Lindsay Buziak was brutally murdered. Police searched for her killers, but found themselves unable to make any arrests for over 15 years. The internet took interest, and social media posts, along with entire websites, sprung up dedicated to solving the case. Then, new advances in forensic technology sparked hope and left everyone asking, will Lindsay's killers finally be brought to justice? This week's episode is The Unsolved Murder of Lindsay Buziak, Part 3. Up uh, in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Well, this episode is the one that I think people always wait for the third one so they can listen all in advance, but also just to hear us wrap it up with the most recent advancements in this case. And sadly, this is one that does not have a, there has been an arrest made at the end. It's still outstanding. Judging by the title of the unsolved murder of Lindsay Buziak, that's probably a given, but it is very, this one is, it gets weird in this episode yeah. for me. A little bit, quite honestly. Some weird stuff starts to happen that I don't really understand the motive or why. And everybody grieves differently. And to lose a child, I can't imagine. We're going to discuss, though, in this one, some some weird moves, perhaps, made by her father. Yeah, and it's sad, unfortunately, when a, a parent, you know, a surviving family member becomes part of the story and not in a, a way of just they're an advocate, but be, has become part of what's being reported on and almost becomes a distraction from the facts of the story, which is what you don't want. You want it all to be, this is the information that's out there, but it's also important because the information that's out there maybe isn't all able to be trusted because just about anybody can make a website. And even if you're related to the victim, if you make a website and let anybody post anything, then suddenly that information starts to maybe cloud what's going on. I got some theories as to maybe why I think these things have happened, but I'll be interested to hear yours as oh, well. Oh, definitely. And I've been deep diving on accident, just but just because it's, you know, a part of my law degree or my law license is I get to sit through, you know, these little uh, continuing ed seminars. And I found a couple on cell phone forensics and I've, I've learned a lot. And uh, I'm happy. I'll be excited to share that when we get to that part of the episode. And also, in so what do we think? Because I got a lot of thoughts. Got a lot of thoughts all right. on all that. Got a lot of problems with you people, and you're all gonna hear about it. Well, for those that have been waiting for part three, here you go. Now you can listen to all of them at one time. If you've been following along each week, then wrap it up. If this is your first time, go back and listen to one and two because. There's a lot to this story, and you would be uh, not doing the story or yourself, you know, justice by only hearing a fraction of it. So yes, yeah, you need the ground the complete work. picture. Got to have the complete picture. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather, and let's get into it. Lindsay Buziak was murdered on February second, two thousand eight. Police chased tips and followed leads, but were not successful in making an arrest for the first three years. Still without answers, her father, Jeff Buziak, conducted his own investigation with a team of volunteers and a private detective. Police made no announcements, but the grieving father told A News in August of 2010 that he expected police to make an arrest imminently. Jeff said in an on-camera interview, We have five people that we're targeting. We know who they are, and we know why. Jeff did not name names on camera, but only offered... Right now, what I'm willing to say is that we believe the people know Lindsay. Importantly, he added, Our list of people does not include Jason Zalo. Jeff told the news outlet he gave some of the information to Saanich police. He ended the interview saying, You can run, but you can't hide. We're right on you. We know who you are, and it's just a matter of time. Jeff's statements turned out to be overly optimistic. No arrests were made. Instead, in February of 2011, 
Jeff led a memorial walk in Saanich from the burial park to the municipal hall to raise awareness about his daughter's case. That same year, Jeff created the website lindsayboosiakmurder.com to gather information and encourage more people to take interest in Lindsay's case. That year, Saanich police finally joined the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit, a move Jeff had been calling for. Sadly, the unit does not take on old cases, so Lindsay's file remained with the Saanich PD. And starting with that, watching the reaction in real time from editorial letters to the editor, people were irritated because they had been very specific. Saanich PD had been very specific in not joining that task force. Months later, this murder happened. Then years drug on. Then they finally join. And because of basically bureaucratic timing, it, it, the thing that should have happened can't even happen now. Like you can't make up for all that lost time. It's good that they finally joined. For Jeff, it really doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, it's meaningless. And so that's yeah. why you see him creating that website, the walk. It's not just a memorial walk. It's almost a protest. People do mm-hmm. hold up signs, advertising for the website, advertising for tips. You know, if anybody knows anything, please come forward, because I think he thinks whoever did this based on whatever information he had at this time in 2010, he seemed very sure he thinks it's someone that's in and around that area. And so visibility in the area near that is important. What I found a bit strange is in one of these walks, he has a noose around his neck, which um, the caption under the photo says, you know, of course has to address it and it says, It's um, like you said, a protest, like it's speaking on his own vulnerability and how, you know, um, there should be more oversight into the the crimes that are being committed. I still find it to be a um, odd choice for a memorial walk in honor of your daughter's murder and perhaps a bit triggering and tasteless for those that have lost uh loved ones in that way yeah the news itself especially in a public area i feel like maybe it's because we're from the south and then and my mind goes to the horrible history of lynching in the south so when i see nooses in public spaces it already is sensitive and i think it's it evokes a certain feeling it may be that culturally up there it doesn't have that same evocative effect but if it didn't then why would you wear it at a protest i think he was purposefully trying to be evocative get attention i mean not only are you going to be in the newspaper but people are really going to be talking about it more instead of oh it's that same old walk again or that same case like oh but did you see this so in yeah that you're case, gonna maybe, get news cameras was, down there you know photographers if you've got a noose around your neck and you're walking down the street. I mean, you just are. So even if it's not, your mind doesn't go to lynching your mind. I mean, it is a very triggering evocative image to see someone with a noose around their neck for a variety of reasons that I think we're all, you know, smart enough to realize. So it didn't sit right with me. It was a little weird. And again, it's very, it's a tricky subject because by no means do I want to uh, besmirch Jeff Busiak's name or how he's grieving. I mean, he lost his daughter in a tragic way. At the same time, and what others will say that work with him over these years is, you definitely are a grieving father. That doesn't give you the carte blanche to just do and say whatever you want. Yeah, and I think that becomes the the issue is that because he not only is he a grieving father, but it's in the space of advocating for his daughter, you may get a little bit more leeway than others might yeah. get in that similar situation you know, if they aren't as related to the case or if you're in another scenario not having to do with your grief. But because it's so frontline, so visceral and so everyday. I mean, he talked on Dr. Phil, I eat, sleep and breathe this. This is all I do when I wake up. And I think kind of shifted focus from a real estate career more to this career in advocacy or, you know, this mission and passion and advocacy. But you're right. It's not just a blank check to say, oh, well, I can behave this way. And we're going to see this is the beginning. 2010, 2011 is really when he perhaps didn't make the most 
uh, the the best choices that would help his daughter's case is what the police have said, essentially. Yeah. Is it's a pattern of behavior over a decade that we're going to see a person losing themselves in grief. And it's extremely yeah, sad. And it is very sad because uh, I can uh, I can't relate because I I can't even speak that. But um, I I could imagine how it would become all consuming. Yeah. Unfortunately, that can also lead to your own mental health suffering. Right. And you can't be a perfect, a good advocate for your loved ones if you don't take care of yourself. Yes, definitely. In May of 2012, Jeff offered a $500,000 reward for any information telling the province news. If somebody walked in and said, I slept with a guy who killed her, give me 500000 and relocate me, I'll give it to you. At the same time, Sergeant Dean Jansen told reporters. This killing was very organized. There was a lot of planning and effort and forethought. These are the most complex crimes, and this is the most egregious crime, and often they can become long-term and complicated. One of those complications, Jansen said, was from... There's people in the community who are withholding information. We know there's a bit of cone of silence around this. I have a question. When law enforcement says stuff like this, like we, we know that people aren't saying stuff, do they know? Or is it a test? Because... How do you know from informants? Like what, what is, if they know that people are withholding stuff? Well, it doesn't matter if they come forward and tell you because you've already been told what they're withholding. Right. Unless it is they say, oh, you know, you bring in a low level drug informant and they're like that real estate. I know who did it. And those are bad people. And they're like, tell us, no, if I tell you, they'll kill me, too. And then you just know that they're withholding it. And you're like, well, we can only arrest you for the crime we can arrest you with. We can't. You know, yeah. And then so I think that's what it is. I would hope that they would have better judgment than to purposefully release misinformation. But p- police have done it before. Yeah, I don't even know if it's as much as misinformation as kind of testing the waters You know, I mean, they might, like you said, you get a tip like that and then you're like, well, I mean, we're not naming names. So to come out and say people are withholding stuff is probably true or at least could be. And then if you're the one that hears that and you are withholding it, it might light a little fire that you're paranoid. They're on to me. I got to I better get to them before they get to me. So could be a tactic. That's true. Yeah. If you if you're worried as the informant about being the one to get caught and then you hear there are people who are withholding information, maybe you think, well, I can tell. And then the killers will just blame someone else. Maybe. With no answers from police, Jeff began knocking on doors with the help of volunteers. In some instances, they would hand out letters asking for information and mentioning the reward. In other instances, Jeff told Dr. Phil he would show up unannounced at possible witnesses' houses to ask them questions. Those people included gang members and drug dealers, according to Jeff. And I wondered in the Dr. Phil interview, because he said that pretty blatantly and openly, he said, I go to knock on people's doors. I don't care if they have a criminal record, if my private investigator has told me that they are dangerous. This is my daughter's case. And that, again, you hear that resolve. Nothing else matters. I am on a mission. And then behavior that is maybe could be detrimental to the investigation or detrimental to your life. Yeah. If you're killed, then who's going to continue to avenge your daughter's death and showing up in the middle of the night to known criminals houses? I'm going to imagine they don't take kindly to somebody knocking on their door at all hours to question them about something like this. Uh, definitely not. And they don't just give up the answers real easy either. Yeah. Yeah. There is, um, I I think it would be easy as a parent grieving and suffering like this to get tunnel vision and kind of, I mean, for me, honestly, what else, what else could you do to hurt me? You know? So I mean, like I've already been through the worst thing ever and now I have dedicated my life to honoring my daughter so there's nothing more dangerous than somebody that has nothing to lose that's true i mean it's it definitely would cause someone to act way beyond their norms that you would say oh well i can't get arrested because i might get fired from my job fuck it i quit my job this is my job now this is now his job yeah so because i can't get arrested because i might go to jail wouldn't that be terrible it's like i live in the worst pain every day so 
Yeah, it's you're right. Sinisterhood will be right back. Your pet's a member of the family, so don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's needs, so you can bring out their best. Nom Nom's is made with real whole food you can see and recognize without any additives or fillers. That's because Nom Nom uses the latest science and insights to make real good food for dogs. Their nutrient-packed recipes are crafted by board-certified veterinary nutritionists, made fresh and shipped free to your door. Nom Nom's already delivered over 40 million meals to good dogs like yours, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail wags. And uh, I loved on the side of the Nom Nom, it said that it, you could use them for a snack. You can give out some Nom Noms as a, a treat, a snack, a little side thing, which uh, in my house, if there's any rustling of a bag, like the Nom Nom bag, the dogs are batshit. I'm a running. <laughs> Sound of the rustle. So you can't just wait till eating time. It's treat no, time. No, little Nom Noms. It's also fun to say. You want nom your Nom Noms? Nom 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 Nom. You want some little Nom Noms? Come get and your little Nom Noms. Like, Give me another Nom Nom. <laughs> I want a Nom Nom. <laughs> Well, plus, Nom Nom comes with a money-back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Go right now for 50% off your no-risk two-week trial at trynom.com slash creepy. Spelled trynom.com slash creepy for 50% off. Trynom.com slash creepy. On his website, Jeff solicited tips and information. Each year, he organized the memorial walk in Saanich and spoke to local media to keep Lindsay's case in the public's eye. He remained bold in his claims to police, saying in an interview on the sixth anniversary of Lindsay's murder. We do know it was somebody who knows her, someone quite close to her, and we know certainly more than one individual is involved. Those facts are certainly well established. You had the issue of saying things like certainly well-established, certainly facts. We know these facts. He speaks with a, a with a certainty and a absoluteness that I think w is what police refer to later as like this is muddying the waters. Because if that's not precise or accurate or it's really what Jeff believes, but it maybe isn't what the evidence is, then the danger comes in going, oh, well, he says they already know who did it. So I don't need to send a tip in. I think this is just my opinion. While he also said Jason Zalo is not on our list of people, he is also pushing the narrative of it was somebody who knows her, they're close to her, and it's more than one person, which would be Jason and Shirley. So maybe he's talking about just the fact that two, you know, people were at the home at the time of her murder, or he is implying that. Two people that know her in her personal life are responsible for this. And if you watch and read interviews with him dated back from right after the crime all the way up until now, like, you know, the last year or so, you can see the shift in narrative. Because at first in 2010, it was there are five people. We know who they are. It's a criminal element. And then in about 2012-ish, 2013, about a year or two after the website, Suddenly, you're right. It's like there was someone extremely close to her who worked with her, who knew her personal schedule and knew. Per so that then he starts to put out the quote unquote facts yeah. that would then they would tend to point more towards Jason and Shirley. And then you do have people on the Internet go, well, I read Lindsay Buziak murder dot com and it said this. Yeah. So I believe it. I never like myself or anyone to speak in absolutes unless it is 100 percent proven that it's absolute. That's true. Yeah, because you can't, and especially in a situation like this where there has been no arrest, no DNA yeah. test, no, I mean, none of that. You can't, he, you can know for certain this is what I think, but I mm -hmm. don't think it's accurate to say we know exactly what happened because if that was the case, hopefully those people would be arrested. I would think so. In August of 2017, nine years after the murder, a chilling message was posted to Jeff's website. It read, Ross Attic says, August 6th, 2017, at 4.12 p.m. I killed Lindsay and stupid cops will never prove it, so you all got nothing. Ask Jay-Z and Sandy Del Alcazar. They know. Vid and her daughter are involved, too. No one gives a shit anymore anyhow except her crybaby dad. Even her fakie girlfriends have washed it away. Typical loser chicks. 
Saanich cops dropped it because they can't solve shit and were told to drop it. Chief Downey has been owned for years. He had to obey, so he cut the phony investigation. It's done. Go home, losers. Forget about her. The street always rules. Bitches die every day. Well. You wake up, or I guess at 4, 12 p.m., you go for, come home, <laughs> come back from lunch and check yeah, the website, and, check and this is up. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's clearly unhinged. There are a lot of misspellings. Some of them seem perhaps intentional. Including Lindsay, which is L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, despite being posted on L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, mm-hmm. com. Same with Sanich. Same with Chief Downey's last name. I mean, words that you would be seeing every day if, you know, I mean, this is all that's all over the news out there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's um, to see this. And he said, you know, it was jaw dropping. Like, I, but who who's to say if it's real or not? I sent it along to the police, yada, yada, yada. At the time, Jeff told the National Post. I read it. I went through my various gyrations and then I copy and pasted it and sent it to police. I'm not here to debate whether the post is real or from a bad guy or not. You've got a lead. Go investigate it and let the police determine it, not the armchair quarterbacks. It's either from the guy who's really kind of kooking out a bit and taunting or it's from some crackhead or it's someone just fucking around. But I don't care. I ask the police to get to the bottom of it. Police did not comment directly on the post only telling reporters that they investigate all tips that come in. Five days later, Jeff was interviewed again, this time regarding a dress found at an area thrift store matching the female suspect's dress exactly. One of Lindsay's friends found the dress at Value Village and bought it. Jeff said, I think there's a high possibility it is the dress. It's an exact replica, bought, used. It doesn't get any closer than that without somebody walking forward saying, I did the murder. This is the dress I used. Jeff turned the dress over to police. So then something like that, where a dress was found in a thrift store, a dress that was mass produced and sold in department stores and was not surprisingly ends up in a thrift store like many clothes do. But instead of saying there is a high possibility of this dress, period, We've given it to the police. It begins to saying, this is the dress. We've already it's found it. It's an exact it. replica. It's which, an, he says, I mean, I guess it's a replica, but that doesn't mean it's the dress. Right? He, But he seemed to imply it is the dress. This is it. And this so is it. It's, I'm giving you evidence. Yeah. And so I think that's the issue is that then it, it just muddles the waters more of like the people go, oh, well, he, they already found the dress versus, yeah. I wonder if that dress is in here. Hmm. You know, because there's more than one. According to Capital Daily, that same year in 2017, two of the volunteer administrators for LindsayBuziakMurder.com quit working for Jeff, accusing him of feeding them misinformation about Lindsay's murder, including the aforementioned confession. Jeff began calling the administrators wacky and threatened to release personal information about them. According to Capital Daily, he was told by Sandwich Police to not contact them any further. So he's not just showing up at strangers' houses in the middle of the night. Perhaps they're involved, perhaps they're not. Now people that have volunteered their time to work on this website are reporting that there's some weird stuff going on. He's giving them misinformation about the case that is then getting posted on this website. And there are other people involved in this and if you start seeing your name out there that you killed somebody and you didn't well i would be pissed off about that oh i agree and especially if i mean and the accusation from the administrator not to the newspaper not like so shout out first of all to capital daily who unearthed more documents in this case than literally any other news outlet and uh, xander sherman i believe is his last name none of this would be we would not be able to report on most of the rest of the episode, but for not only his dogged search for all these documents, but Capital Daily putting their their money behind it and mm-hmm. actually going to court to get this stuff unleashed. This is the so- kind of journalism that gets cases reopened and solved. I mean, Mandy Matney with the Murdoch yes. trials, like she was integral in getting that case covered. And I mean, look what that ended up. So yeah, absolutely. Hopefully... 
with this type of reporting. And also, I think the understanding that, like, you can't just say whatever you want. We're going to yeah. find out. Like, we want this story to be above board. And we also want to want justice. But it's going to come in an honest way. Definitely. And and I think you and I were at first, they, like I said, but for Capital Daily unearthing these police records, a lot of stuff the theories in this case are completely unfounded. You could spend hours on entire websites where there's just claim after claim after claim made and no, just something as simple as a newspaper headline, you know, a CTV, you know, Canadian TV or CNN or just something where it had been reported somewhere. But Capital Daily comes with receipts, <laughs> with all the receipts. They are like your uncle who never throw away any tax return for any years and he just has cabinets. There's thousands of documents, including this email exchange, which is what I was going to say is the administrator didn't make these claims to Capital Daily. Capital Daily got a hold of records, including emails sent and received by lindsaybuziakmurder.com. And in that email exchange, one of the volunteer administrators said, yes, you are a grieving father, but that does not give you a free pass to verbally abuse people or slander their name. And that's when Jeff called them wacky. And then he told them yeah, that he was going to release the information if he didn't get a response in 48 hours. That's just like, what is this? He's gone rogue. I mean, I, I honestly really, in my opinion, like you said, we're seeing the grief take hold of this man and completely mold him into a different person. And you're going to do things that, like you said, you wouldn't do otherwise. And if you have nothing to lose and your only goal in life is to find your daughter's murderer, you, you can become this kind of problematic vigilante where you'll stop at nothing, but it's like, you can't just defame and besmirch the good name of like people in the community that there's no evidence that they did this. And, you know, to go on there and call Jason or Shirley or anybody a murderer, you are you can't do that. Because, I mean, you can, but there's going to re be repercussions. And that's why, like you were saying, these clickbaity headlines and stuff, that type of journalism and reporting is so <coughs> problematic and damaging because you, you're just writing one article, but the repercussions that can have on a person you don't even know the full extent of the ripple effect so you gotta have people like capital dailies that are like we're going all in on this and they unearth stuff that like all of a sudden everyone's like wait what there's like weird stuff going back and forth between her dad and employees over the website you start to peel back the onion and weird shit starts to pop up Oh, definitely. And it just gives you kind of a clearer picture. And it's again, it's like you've now because it's true. It's like there are two things. It's like the persona you want to say of like, I'm the dad that's willing to stop at nothing. And then you have reporters that are like, hey, man, we got your emails. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we see how you behave. Yeah. Like, it's true. It's sad because it should not be the primary subject of this story is her dad's behavior and the way that he's dealing with it. But it is becoming such a distraction that you can't report on the story without discussing it because of what we're about to discuss next. And at some point, your behavior is going to start taking the spotlight over your daughter's murder. And I don't think that's at all what he set out to do. Never. No. In one of its many articles on the case, Capital Daily reported that Jeff indicated to police that he had a degree of involvement in the false confession posted on his website in 2017. Jeff also failed to provide police with the IP address of the poster, according to the documents. The false confession seemed to further the chasm between Jeff and Saanich police. Jeff referred to Sergeant Chris Horsley, who was working Lindsay's case, as cocaine horsley on his website after horsley commented publicly that people posting false confessions misinformation and really a bunch of nonsense on the internet hindered the investigation okay this is where it takes a turn i'm now <laughs> i will now lay out some opinions that i have please okay before that in addition to starting to call chris horsley cocaine horsley and kind of you know these knocks at him. He had also spoken with 
a former Canadian Mountie turned like true crime blogger that was covering the case. And the this guy also said to him, like, you can't just make stuff up. Because when he talked to him about the murder, he said he got the impression that Jeff wasn't being completely honest about stuff or was maybe giving him misinformation. And he actually called Jeff out on it to his face. It didn't end well. And then previously he had been, you know, positive about him on his website. And then Jeff starts referring to him as P collector. Cause I think oh, he had also right. been like a, um, like a parole officer, if that's what they're also called there. Yes. He, he worked in drug and alcohol screening. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So as soon as somebody kind of shuts the door, turns on him, it seems, then it becomes like scorched earth. Yeah. And that's what the the man, the his last name is Rogers. Mr. Rogers said, I don't feel privileged. I knew that was going to happen. Like he turns on people. I just know mm-hmm. that if you at all disagree with him, he'll turn on you. So as far as this confession, which... It has never been like absolute proven that it is false. However, it didn't go anywhere. And there was even like rumors of the administrators that were had the falling out with Jeff, like saying like, this is not true. Like he he has a hand in this to cops when they asked him, can we get the IP address of where that came from? He just kind of ghosted them and, and wouldn't answer So it was all these things like, if you really want to help the investigation, why aren't you turning this over? Like, this is a person that is, this is all you've been wanting is somebody to confess to the crime. And this person allegedly has, wouldn't you do everything you can to help them find him? Yeah. This is my theory. I think, and this is all speculation based on the evidence of hand. This is my own personal opinion. I do think that Jeff either wrote this himself or someone helped him write it and they posted it. But why I I think the intention behind it was to kind of force the Saanich PD's hand at investigating stuff in hopes that maybe they would turn up something along the way that they wouldn't have otherwise because they were just kind of, in Jeff's opinion, they weren't investigating it. So I think he was like, putting these breadcrumbs and red herrings out not to try and implicate somebody and like falsely get somebody arrested, but just to like force them to investigate. And then hopefully they actually find something worth a shit while they're doing it. That's a good point of for the motive, because I wondered if the number of people mentioned were was purposeful because it wasn't posted by anonymous. It was posted by Ross ADDIC, which police traced to they said it was an allusion to a person named ross adicott who police spoke with and denied authoring the post and i guess didn't author it but that would be one name and then in the false confession he mentions jay-z i'm assuming jason zalo but it's j-a-y-z like the the rapper okay that way makes way more sense than what i thought (laughs) Okay, Sandy, Sandy Del Alcazar, Vid and Medardo. I don't know who those people are, but that would be four people named in the confession. Plus, Ross is the fifth that posted it. And in 2010, when Jeff Buziak said, oh, we know there's five people that are going to get arrested. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm wondering if he has it stuck in his head that that's who did it. That's who is responsible. And you're exactly right. He's like, "Okay, well, if I just like put this confession on there and tell the cops like, I don't know if it was Ross or not. Who knows who it was? Maybe these are the five people you should go talk to because they got named in it. That would make sense. And he's denied authoring it. But Capital Daily, what they got was police records, notes from officers. And to police, it says he acknowledged a degree of involvement. And Sergeant Horsley said, I did confront Jeff about the site, but he just Jeff didn't provide ip addresses which would be a very easy way for the police to go track down who wrote it Mm -hmm. and so probably he doesn't want them to know who wrote it i would draw that conclusion i also wonder what i mean and we i couldn't find anything uh, as far as what a level of involvement actually means but to say there was any type of involvement to me immediately says it well then it's false it's not yeah it's not real you knew if you had a degree of involvement in the false confession, therefore you knew that the police had involvement in the false confession. What that has now done, 
at least for me personally, is I have to then look at everything he Jeff Buziak says with a little bit of a hmm. Yeah. Because after this confession was posted, he told the National Post, which is a legitimate, large publication. I read it. I had to give it to the police to determine who is real. But if you read it, if you read it, if you really read it, it's what he said to the National Post. He didn't say I didn't post it. He said, I read it. He said he went through it. He said he copied and pasted it. He said he sent it to police. And then he said, I'm not here to debate whether the post is real or from a bad guy or not. You've got a lead. You go investigate it. Yeah. But I also don't agree with that he isn't there to debate this because all of his other actions would say otherwise. He's going on talk shows. He's showing up at people. All he wants to do is find out if this is the bad guy. So... He, I feel like he kind of like walks it back a bit, like trying to, you know, distance himself a bit. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not the cops, so I gave it to them. Well, you're acting like the cops in all other situations. So right. it, you're right, you know though. what I mean? The two don't don't mesh well for me. But you're totally right. I think this backs up what you're saying, that he was just trying to stir the pot to get the cops to go look at something. Because he says in that quote, you've got a lead, go investigate it. So you're right. I think it was, if he had some involvement in it, which it sounds like according to the Capitol Daily and these police docs that he did, that it was just sort of like, here, here's, yeah. a, here's a lead, go get it, like, to them, and maybe feeling like the ends justified the means. I, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I have kind of similar thoughts about the dress, too. Oh, that it was... Purchased, not or found, or um, it could have been found. It also could have been purchased, and you know, I mean, again, on eBay or something. I, I, it's it was interesting that it was one of Lindsay's friends that found it, but that could also be because it is Lindsay's friend, and she's at a thrift store, and she knows what that dress looks like, so it's at the top of her mind, and of course, she would buy it. Mm-hmm. It could I, again, it could just be. Look, there's evidence in the area. Everyone needs to be investigating in the area just to get movement. And I hope, because I know the the drawing came from the eyewitness, but I really hope that the dress really does look like that. And, it, and it's not just a dress that vaguely resembles the witness's drawing, but now we've gone off on this other tangent because somebody, quote unquote, found a dress. You know, like, is that really what the dress looked like would be my question. Mm -hmm. Or is it we found a dress in a thrift store and now we have a dress that we can tell everybody to be on the lookout for? I don't know. It just, again, what it's done and is what Chris Horsley said, is it just sort of, it shakes the veracity of all the claims. It just makes you suspicious of of what everybody's saying. It makes you a little less credible. Definitely. Sinisterhood will be right back. Well, I was using my cloud foam in the shower <laughs> earlier. And just How'd something that about the, the sh- if you're not aware of this Athena cloud foam, it comes out yes, the sound nice. it comes and the mm-hmm. way it just it like bubbles. So you don't even need billows. to do that much because when you sh- it billows like a cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Just like it. Yes, a little bit goes a long way. I've had the so same much. can for a long time because a little bit goes a very long way. I had to get used to it because I used to shoot out too much. And I was like, well, this is my whole body head to toe because <laughs> normally this would have been just for one leg. Like, but you're I right, look the like a safe puffed marshmallow man because <laughs> oh, I've sprayed God. out too much cloud foam. And Did I you don't shave want your... to waste it. I shaved everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not all because we got to shave them with something, right? The yeah. razors. Tell you what, Athena Club's razor has thousands of five-star reviews from customers, and the magic starts with the blades. They're surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, so you get a silky smooth shave that leaves your skin soft and hydrated, not stripped dry. The razor kit is also only 10 bucks, and it comes with two blade cartridges, a magnetic hook for shower storage, which... If you're like me and both my kids were like, we want to take a shower in your shower today because they get to just run around and I was like, it's like a splash pad. Isn't this fun? (laughs) Isn't this fun, children? (laughs) But But please also don't touch the razor. (laughs) Well, it was up on its hook, Mm -hmm. so they can't. Got it. There you go. You also get to choose your choice of handle color. I've never had a navy razor before, and now I do. I take that back. I've never had a good looking quality 
navy razor. I've had the plastic ones that'll rip you to shreds, but nothing like this. I also got a rose gold one. I love them both. Whatever your style is, your aesthetic, your bathroom colors, they probably have a color to match it. You got to get one for every bathroom. You also don't have to worry about those dull blades like you talked about. You get refills on your schedule. You got to choose how often and then boom, they're right there automatically sent to you by Athena Club with free shipping. You always got the best blades for the best shave. And like Heather said, you got to get that cloud shave foam. It's so thick. It stays on your skin while you shave so you don't have to constantly reapply. Your legs are just silky smooth. It's It's hot as shit outside now. We're all Mm -hmm. wearing shorts. If that, you know, I would love to just, I mean, you can't, it's so hot. So you got to have your smooth legs. If that's your thing, you want to have smooth legs. This is how you do it. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club razor kit. Head to athenaclub.com and use code creepy for 25% of your first order. Again, that's athenaclub.com and use code creepy for 25% off. Athena Club also launched in Target stores nationwide, so make sure to check out the shaving aisle to buy their products in-store in real life. On the 10-year anniversary of Lindsay's murder in 2018, Saanich Police Sergeant Chris Horsley told Global News why the department was struggling to close the case. Certainly makes it harder when these pre-planned events and people have conspired beforehand to make sure they're not apprehended. We firmly believe there is a reasonable sized group that has knowledge. Those are the people we have always sought out and we continue to do so. Well, a reasonable sized group, five people sounds like a reasonable sized group to me. So there, you know, there's probably a lot of truth in all of the theories that Jeff has. It could be. You just, you have to have evidence, you know, like yeah. he's got theories, but you can't for, formulate a confession which is the allegation here. Right. In 2020, a team of journalists from Capital Daily interviewed dozens of people, obtained more than 1,000 emails, and petitioned the B.C. Supreme Court to unseal 35 applications to obtain judicial authorizations. The documents were partially released to the public and reveal previously unknown details of the case. The first of two major revelations came regarding Lindsay's computer activity in the days before her death. Lindsay and Jason shared a Toshiba laptop, which Saanich police turned over to RCMP's Technological Crime Unit for analysis. Court documents unearthed by Capital Daily show that. Data related to internet chat communications had recently been deleted. RCMP's account was redacted in part, so only some information is available. What is known is that the deleted data came from a folder called My Received Files that resides within the My Documents folder. The report also noted that a temporary file on the laptop contained past word processing activity, emails, and internet browsing activity. The report also noted that there were chat messages at one time, but they've since been erased. But did not include when they were erased. Well, There's another something. piece of the puzzle maybe falls into place. I won't even say falls into place. Another piece is thrown Available. into the mix. Right. Yeah. Available in the, the pile that we have on the table. That's interesting because it does seem like a window of data was deleted is what they described it mm-hmm. as. Like from certain date to certain date about a week before January 24th, I think, was the start date. So, And there was the whole... Theory that when she was in Calgary and she Facebook messaged her previous high school friend that is involved in criminal activity, are those the deleted messages? Are they deleted messages to a friend about her relationship problems between her and Jason? There's no way to know. That's a good point of not just they don't know when they were erased, but by whom or why. Like if you're like, I don't want Jason to see these or... I don't want anyone to see what Lindsay was saying, so I'm going to delete these. I don't know. The release document showed the police studied Lindsay's Facebook activity, noting how her posts dropped to zero between January 24th and February 3rd, 2008, an anomaly based on her use history. Just two months after Lindsay's murder, police asked Facebook in court to provide deleted wall messages. Based on the way Facebook operated in 2008, 
police suggested that Lindsay or someone with access to her account had to have deleted the message. Capital Daily reports that police notes outlined the need for Facebook to release the data, saying, Wall messages may be deleted, but only the user may delete messages posted on their own wall through their use of their own account. Police said in the petition to the court, the deleted wall messages may hold the key to identifying Lindsay's killer. And that was old old school Facebook style. Is, I guess if you once you posted it on my wall, only I could get rid of it. Or someone now, with your password that could log yes, in as you. And by I is my profile can get yeah, rid of it. Yeah, yeah. So anybody sitting in my seat could get rid of it, but it had to be logged in as me. Like you couldn't just delete your own message if you changed your mind later, which I forgot was a feature. What a terrible feature. Oh, you mean like if I posted on your wall and wanted to de- delete it later, I couldn't have. Only yeah, I can delete it. Yeah, that would have sucked. Regret? I think, Such regret. can't you now? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. They changed that. And you can edit your posts and stuff for a while. Yeah, you can yeah, yeah. edit stuff either. But yeah, so this was just, they were basing it on the operations of Facebook back then. So yeah, they know somebody who had access to the Toshiba laptop is the person, or who had hacked her account from somewhere else, I suppose. She's True. If Facebook would have the data of what IP address was logged in, where and when. A crime analyst named Laura Manning assisted Saanich PD with analyzing Lindsay's Facebook friends. According to partially redacted court documents, Manning discovered a clear anomaly, Lindsay's connection to the drug world via her Facebook friends. Manning noticed that several of Lindsay's 700 friends were known to police to be involved in criminal drug activity. Other officers also noted the social connections to those involved in crime. Reporter Xander Sherman spoke with close friends of Lindsay for his podcast, Murder on the Island, and one friend explained that Lindsay used her Facebook page as a networking tool for her professional career rather than her social life. Friends and family have insisted Lindsay did not use drugs and was happy that Jason also did not use. So again, it's clear that she was not a dealer, she was not a user, but it sounds like she was an acquaintance of somebody who was either dealer or user involved somehow in the trade. Yeah, if you're using your Facebook for networking and you got 700 friends, I mean, I don't know who all I'm friends with on Facebook. I certainly don't know what everybody does for a living or as a side hustle. For all I know, I got all sorts of people on there that are criminals. Right. I mean, I don't think they're posting their drugs for sale in the Facebook no. marketplace, which yeah. also didn't exist back then. But I don't think it would be overt. And you're, you're right. How many human connections in real life which we were even less connected back in 2008 but how many connections could we a person maintain 30 50 100 maybe but not even that close connections where you would know if somebody was like committing a crime on a regular basis like friends of yours who would tell you that they were a drug dealer Mm -hmm. i would say there's maybe each each of us has 20 people that we're maybe that close to if we're lucky five maybe even if we're not Mm -hmm. that trustworthy with secrets i was like i don't think i know 20 people that would tell me they were a drug dealer (laughs) i don't know 20 people that would be drug dealers but i know 20 people that if they had i do know 20 people that would be drug dealers but that okay the opposite that would say that people that had like a big secret a high stakes secret i'm also a lawyer though so i feel like if people were like i'm doing drugs like what do i do i'd be like give me a dollar so okay now I'm your lawyer. <laughs> now I don't. I won't tell anyone. But maybe that's why people feel the need to confess very deep things to me. But you're. But like, if she has 700 friends, it's and seven of them are massive cartel members. Unless you tell me that she visited their profile each and like looked through all their photos, there's no way she would have known. I mean, absent the one that she maybe went to coffee with or yeah. drinks with or whatever. The second revelation was regarding the, quote, crime phone used to lure Lindsay to the house. Reporter Xander Sherman told CTV News. The most important finding is police allege they know the name of whoever or whatever is ultimately responsible for that phone. I certainly think there are now many more questions than there were previously. According to Capital Daily, the real name of the owner of both phones, the one to call Lindsay and the other used to check that phone's voicemail, is known to police, but has not been released publicly. And you got to hold on to information. So, you know, when somebody's giving you the truth, you got to hold some little nuggets back. Right. That's true. I guess if you bring somebody in for questioning and they say, you know, who, who bought the cell phone and they give you the wrong name, you'd be like, oh, they're full of shit. Mm-hmm. 
uh, you'd be able to fact check against him. I think that's uh, not surprising to me that they now know the owner of both phones because it just it's been this long and you've had that yeah. long to go through all the data. Yeah. And also technology has evolved so much. Most definitely. The release documents also showed that police conducted more cell phone analysis than was previously believed. Capital Daily reports that police obtained cell tower data of all other users who pinged the same cell towers as the crime phone. However, that produced a large amount of information, the fate of which is unknown. And that's what I was, let me grab my drawing that I had to make while I was sitting through this CLE about searching, you know, about basically about cell phone evidence, but that's called a reverse geofence where you draw a box around a given location and try to utilize the data of what towers pinged around this certain location. And then they basically said, and by they, I mean this expert that was explaining it, he was saying that you would ask for data on the closest three or four towers. Each tower site may have four towers, one per cell phone provider. So you imagine one cell tower site might have four towers on it, one for AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and a fourth whatever competitor. And then after that, each tower can contain up to 10,000 phone numbers. So then law enforcement will basically end up with, say there's four towers on each tower site, 640,000 phone numbers to go through times yeah, all those well, data so you that's a lot of and then you'd have mm -hmm. to just analyze it down and go okay this one pinged tower a but not tower b but it did ping tower c i mean it's just cross-reference 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 takes so much very data. long time yes so much data and isn't it wild that it can be obtained oh yeah that's a that's the other part that it doesn't really it's not pertinent to this because it's not the united states jurisprudence surrounding cell phone privacy and technology uh because this case happened in canada but we've got a lot to be concerned about, just about data privacy. I just learned about your um, advertising ID. Like everybody's cell phone has a unique code attached to it that's anonymized but available. And basically, you're always tracked all the time forever if you have anything Google on your phone. This particular expert was saying that, and iCloud also separately tracks you, but they said specifically Google tracks the most. So if you have Google Maps on your phone, Gmail, the Google search app, everything that, I mean, that's like moment by moment, second by second location that the police can easily get. But So then on top if of you had your phone on you for 24 hours and you were missing, you please could get documents from Google that minute by minute would show exactly where you were, where your phone was and where you this, were. My understanding based on this expert. Yes. And also that no matter he even showed having one cell phone turned on airplane mode and one cell phone just regular. And even in airplane mode, it still tracks you. And Paris was sitting on the couch and he was on. He, he won't mind me telling you he's just playing a game on his phone. And then he just looks up and goes. Unless you take the battery out, you're always being tracked. And then just look back down and kept playing his game. And I said, well, why didn't that guy take the battery out? And he leaned up. He's like, cell phone companies don't make removable batteries anymore. Really? And I was like, bum, bum, bum. So we're all being tracked all the time. Well, that's why you see in the movies, in the picture shows, how they mm -hmm. take a hammer and bash the shit out of it. Bash or that bitch. <laughs> throw it in the bottom of the ocean or, or something. Because yeah. otherwise... It's like a cockroach can't be killed. It cannot. The data is there. And they were talking about the anonymized data is that they can just after you pick an area, they were talking about if you were trying to solve a bank robbery, you would just say every cell phone that went to this Chase Bank in this period. And then you would just follow the ones that like, OK, well, the robbery started at noon. So whoever showed up around noon in this area and then you just track that phone and see where it went. And you're like, oh, it went to this apartment that's registered to this guy who's robbed five banks before. That's probably him. Let's go get him. Like you just you didn't have probable cause to search that data. You just combed through. Da so where does your privacy start and end? Mm. Like they so can how just legally can they do that then? That's the question I said. That's outside. The, we can talk about it in our mini so this month when we talk about digital evidence in the courtroom and Siri, because, yeah, it, we get into Fourth Amendment, United States jurisprudence, but and it is changing. There's been two new cases that have come out about not only just your phone itself tracking that, but where it pings and who owns what data and where are you and when it's I mean, it's emerging. Well, even in 
Lindsay's case, I mean, they were mm-hmm. able to tell that the burner phone that was used to call her came across on a ferry from Vancouver to the island mm-hmm. and was there for 24 hours before the actual murder, which led them to assume that the killers had arrived early to stake out the place and get familiar with it. So someone had to say, okay, well, we need to get cell phone records of everything in this area. However, I would say there is probable cause because a murder's been committed. But you've just gotten data for 640,000 people that didn't do shit wrong, Uh, right? Or did they? That's the argument. Or did they? And now they're going to get found out. And they (laughs) all 640. But there was no probable cause to find it out, which kind of like sting operations. I got a bunch of hot takes on this. But yeah, I mean. Don't get Christy started on entrapment. (laughs) Her honor does not hear entrapment cases. She hates them. (laughs) I, 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 it's an interesting point that there was a reason that in Lindsay's case, they needed to know where was this phone? Cause it was, a, they had the, the phone number. They had the number. Correct. Yeah. In this case, they could track the number. It yeah. wasn't just cell site data, but what I hope they did. And what I think they had, and I'm not saying anything they did was illegal or against anybody's rights. Um, honestly, because case law in a lot of places isn't settled, but what I'm assuming that they did is You would say, okay, this is the phone number. Where did it come over on this ferry? Then you would try to geofence and say what pinged the exact towers or if there if it was a burner phone, it probably doesn't have like what we have nowadays, like Bluetooth. If I come to your house, it's obvious that I've been to your house. There's a digital record because my phone would be like, hey, I'm Bluetooth. And your Bluetooth Mm -hmm. speaker would be like, I'm Bluetooth. Well, we don't need to connect. But that like, hey, it's connect. I mean, it's it's tracked. So. Wait, exactly. It's tracked. So I would hope they would just geofence and go wherever this phone went, what other phone went the same place. And maybe mm-hmm. that's yeah. maybe that's all. That's the owner. And that's how you found him. Sinisterhood will be right back. In 2021, Sandwich Police announced they created a new team to take a fresh look at Lindsay's case. In addition to officers from Sandwich, the group included participants from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as well as the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. A spokesperson for the Sandwich PD expressed hope to CTV News, especially regarding new technology that may help solve the case, saying, Advancements in fields such as genealogy and DNA analysis has led to a resolution in many other cases. What an interesting statement that she brings up genealogical DNA analysis because they said forever, we don't have DNA, we don't have DNA. And that makes me think that maybe they have DNA and they don't want to say that until they have Golden State killer these people. True. Yeah. I mean, they did make kind of overstatements about how we don't have any DNA. We don't have mm-hmm. fingerprints, hair fibers, anything. So like that name that they say they're holding on to. I mean, if they did have DNA and that's the one thing that they know is going to put somebody away. Maybe they're keeping it, playing their cards close to their chest. Mm -hmm. You would obviously still run it through the database. So what is even more of a privacy violation? Like say a relative of whoever killed this person, their DNA shows up. Ipso facto, we golden state killer, this guy. Yeah, no, no, no. You're right. For you're talking about the privacy rights to your DNA information, which you for Mother's Day just received a DNA test, I did. didn't you? <laughs> I yeah. asked for I I'm Tommy You were asking for Tommy it. Tommy is a sneaky gift giver. He's because so good. he will because he edits the show, he'll hear me talking about things oh, and then it'll just heck. like it'll just show up like on my desk or he'll just like bring me something because when you told me i mentioned he, it he got you chicago greatest hits records i was he like did. he's a fucking legend <laughs> legend because gift giver he's and a legendary the, he gift is giver. a great gift giver the other um when we were driving to houston, houston. i made everyone listen to chicago for a <laughs> long time and like and, a high volume <laughs> and i brought Same. up how when tommy and i first dated he I came was listening to Chicago. He came over. He was like, this isn't it. But and I brought that up again. And then he showed up with two Chicago's greatest hits. So look at that. And the hamburger maker, which Ella had not discussed previously with Tommy about it. I he heard me talk about it on the show that Ella told me she was going to get me a hamburger maker. And then he went out and found this tiny little hamburger press that is shaped like a hamburger. 
It's perfect. So that's the hack, gentlemen. If you want to be a good husband, <laughs> is just edit your wife's podcast. It's great. Yeah, You'll listen hear all of her to and her dreams. conversations and then with her uh, best friend. write down stuff she wants. Uh, yeah. Well, one of his wonderful DNA yes. gifts was a DNA test. And you're and right. Me. 23 me will very at first whenever people submitted their DNA to that there wasn't any policy or if there was a policy you sort of agreed and opted in and now most of them either you have to opt in specifically or the terms of use will tell you we do com- comply with reasonable law enforcement orders or court orders or things like that it's the same as google or facebook says in your terms of service with them that hey if you're doing crimes on gmail we're not going to rat you right away but if the cops come correct with an order we're going to let it fly sorry i mean that's what the policy says verbatim by the way Um, (laughs) we're gonna let it fly (laughs) we're gonna let it fly dude sorry bro uh but for real i think that the nowadays it's it's more that direction there's a website called Jedmatch. there are websites where you can take once you've got it analyzed from 23andme or ancestry or whatever it'll it kicks out like a really specific kind of it looks like jumbled letters but it's that's kind of the core data and you can download that from your commercial website and go take it to uh Jedmax actually got bought out i don't say that up to date with it but it was there's websites that are aggregators for if you want to participate and help law enforcement and say here's my dna in case it helps oh if you were into it, because if you if I got a call from Ancestry that goes, hey, the cops, just so you know, a cousin of a cousin or this person or whoever, tur- or, you know, your great grandfather turned out to be this horrible kill. What am I going to go? No, please hide the truth from the victim's families. Right. Don't be killing people. And yeah. sorry, I wanted to know where my shit was from. So <laughs> sorry, great grandpa. That's on you. <laughs> but I mean, for real, I, I would say that it depends if it's your DNA. So up to you now with you. You have your uh, your test, too. But. Uh, it's oh, important I'm putting it out everywhere. I'm it, test everybody, <laughs> test it. But I think with this, my the way that she said that there's been advancements in the field. I, to me, it would say they would ha- they have DNA. They've run it through a database. They don't know who it is, but there's some sort of a relational match that they're mapping, a, maybe mapping some genealogy mm-hmm. to try to get to a person, mm, or they yeah. have already mapped it and are like. It's the same person as the cell phone name. We know exactly who this is, and we just need blank, which I don't know if you had cell phone ownership and the DNA, why you would sit on that, but... I, why would you? You just question. can't find the person? Uh, they're either incarcerated on another crime, in which case I would say go ahead and charge them, or they are helping the government in a way, and yeah. they're protected, and they're an informant if there's some sort of cartel connection, or they're on the run, they're in another country, they That's know better. That's what I'm saying. Like, you might not yeah. just be able to find them. Yeah, or yeah, or you don't they know could be dead. They're... Yeah. Or they're dead. Yeah. Even so, the spokesperson told CTV that all suspects and possible witnesses would be interviewed again. He reiterated the importance of the public's help, saying, We know there's likely information that has not been shared. We believe people familiar with the circumstances surrounding the case remain in the community. It is not too late to come forward. Once again, with the local uh, pleas, if you are the one that knows this and you're living in an area, they obviously know you already. I would come. I mean, come forward. They know that you know. I can't can't be looking over my I I have such a guilty conscience and I don't like to have things hanging over me. This would end me. I would have to turn myself in. Yes. Like just even if it's a small piece of information, they know, you know, go tell them. Because sometimes I think people think. Well, I don't have like anything huge. I mean, offhandedly, she once mentioned this guy she went to high school with. Like something that's like so small to you could blow a case wide open. You never know like what just like small little detail and all the pieces start to fall into place. Right. If you go like, and I did see a couple running down that street near DeSouza and then jumped in like a red whatever, you Mm -hmm. know, like just happened to remember just a truck or something. It sounds like, though, from the pleas from now with uh, the Sanich PD, as well as with this task force, it seems like it's a criminal enterprise. They're saying it without saying it. They're like a reasonable amount of people know there are a lot of circumstances. It's really complex. You mean complex, like a large ongoing criminal enterprise? Mm hmm. New professional eyes were on the case, but no major breakthroughs were announced. Regardless, interest in the case seemed to grow with those on social media websites. In 2022, Capital Daily called Lindsay's murder the case the internet got wrong. The outlet worked hard for two years to diminish the amount of misinformation floating around online about the case and pushed for greater government transparency. In their analysis, 
Capital Daily determined Sanich PD applied for and received more than 35 warrants and production orders for 10 companies, including Facebook, Bell Mobility, and BC Ferries. They've also conducted more than 400 interviews and have identified around 2,000 entities, including people of interest and witnesses. Though Capital Daily continued pushing for information, it reported in 2022 that a judge denied the request in a closed hearing. According to the judge, Lindsay's case is one of extraordinary complexity and that the people involved are violent with no regard for human life. And this is another ding, ding, ding. There's a large criminal enterprise behind it. A judge does not hold an ex parte in camera hearing. The, the Capitol Daily attorneys were not allowed in the judge's chambers as he discussed the request with the police. Well, which is not it's not wrong. It's not illegal. It no, just no, means no. There's an extreme high level of information. That's that what I'm d- saying. It made me think like somebody's an informant or, or, or something to where they're being protected. It has to be. And and just the judge saying, um, it's extraordinarily complex and they're extremely violent. Do you mean like part of a large cartel or gang? I mean, fill in the blank. I think, though, it can, it's also vague enough to where like he could just be speaking about this is a complex case. Obviously, the people involved are violent. They stabbed her 40 times. And clearly a person that does that wouldn't have regard for human life. So you could also just say these things about anyone with that that could have done this. Yeah. And you have to keep it vague, it sounds like, especially if they're kicking the reporters out of the meeting. In emails obtained by the outlet, Jeff explained that he made certain asset transfers in anticipation of lawsuits because of the website. He claimed to have transferred everything he owned except an old pickup truck out of his name in case he was sued. His planning was fortuitous because in May of 2022, Jason's mom, Shirley Zalo, filed suit against Jeff Buziak. She sued him for defamation in B.C. Supreme Court, claiming Jeff and two other defendants published claims online that Shirley murdered Lindsay. Can't do that. Yeah, we knew the day was coming. I mean, the comments by the anonymous posters were pretty egregious. And uh, presuming Canadian law is, follows U.S. law as far as defamation and your liability as a website owner, that if you have the capability of publishing comments and deleting comments, allowing comments or disallowing comments, and you exercise that authority over it, you exercise that domain over your website and delete certain comments but not others, you've effectively published the ones that you didn't delete. That's U.S. jurisprudence. So like our like if you've ever written a defamatory thing and by you, I mean, listeners, if you've ever written something defamatory on our social media, I will delete it because I don't want to publish something that's defamatory that because we exercise domain and control over that. And you don't want to incur liability. Anybody will do other shows will do it. Or you'll see places like Reddit where there's no there's moderation by volunteers. That's very specific for Different And then again, Reddit has now said, well, it's a volunteer moderator. We're not posting that. Those people are posting it and those moderators are allowing it. So it's it becomes a sticky situation. Yeah, you shirk the blame, pass, pass the buck to somebody else. Jeff's co-defendants are Nora Liza Monroe and Jane Cavanaugh, who, according to the complaint, published defamatory comments about Shirley on Jeff's site. The suit claimed that Shirley has been suffering. Loss and damage to her reputation, loss of income, and stress, anxiety, and other mental suffering. Due to Jeff's defamatory comments, she sought unspecified damages and an injunction against further posts. Shirley and both her sons were cleared by Sanich PD in 2009 and 2010 of any involvement in Lindsay Buziak's murder. And the, that's the issue is that it was just statements that are like, I bet SZ had something to do with her. I bet. And it was very clear. They meant Shirley Zalo be like SZ bought Lindsay a condo. And so it was enough clarity that enough information to where you didn't have to guess. And it was obvious who they were talking about. And that would cause you a ton of mental stress and anxiety. People you work with, see that your loved ones, your kid. I mean, well, her kids are also being, dragged through social media and if they did have something to do with it then you know we'll we'll see it come out in this 
they 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 were right. They shouldn't have been sued for defamatory statements. Until that happens, though, like you got to keep it under wraps because, like you said, you're distracting from what should really be the focus, and that's finding Lindsay's murderer. I think that they think, oh well, we're, we're helping by doing that. But when you go about it in a way that's going to impede the investigation or is illegal, now you got to deal with that. And so it distracts from your actual cause. Oh, it, absolutely. And it and luckily, it's a civil matter. So hopefully it's not distracting the police, but definitely the public. And then also when you do maintain that website, I think you have a responsibility. I mean, it's your website. Do whatever you want. But understanding that if it's a case that is the police have said, over and over again now, I mean, despite at the beginning going, we don't need any tips. At least now they've said over and over, we know there's people that know, we know there's information we need. And if it's an open unsolved case, I would argue you would want it to be bare bones. This is what is proven and what we know and not get down in the mud and the muck of like, but what if this and wouldn't it? I bet da 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 is happening. And it's like, we don't fucking care what you bet or what you wonder or what you think. You deal in reasonable doubt, probable cause, provable evidentiary things that just go in like, I bet as Z really in the comments that they're being sued for obviously are defamatory because it's nothing there wasn't anything provable in there and what is provable i bet they can't prove which would be your defense so if the idea was i'm going to go on there and say that shirley and jason did it so i'll get sued for defamation and then i can prove in court that it's true oh. maybe maybe that's an expensive way to do it it's an expensive way but maybe that's it sinisterhood will be right back in response jeff called the lawsuit an aggravating sidetrack. And told reporters from CTV News. My focus is on finding the killers and seeing that justice is done. We've got killers on the loose right now. Somebody's suing me because I'm busy trying to find the murderers of my daughter? Lindsay's mother, Evelyn, does not agree with her ex-husband's allegations and feels Shirley has every right to press charges. The case appears to be currently pending. And the two posters have both said, uh, Nora uh, Monroe and Jane Cavanaugh have both said to different news outlets, like, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. This is this is shocking. But Shirley Zalo said, we I had to do something because it got to where people would want to hire her and then go to Google her. And these websites come up with unfounded, unproven accusations. And she said, nobody wants a Zalo sign in their yard. And that mm. makes sense when you're a real estate agent, your last name sometimes can be your bread and butter. And if it's a super small community in a small island, yeah, you're probably losing a big chunk of your business. Yep, definitely. It's interesting that Lindsay's mother is kind of polar opposite of of Jeff. And yeah, again, everyone grieves in their own way. Some, it might be, I want to be, you know, boots on the ground, sun up to sundown, trying to find them and involve a bunch of people. Other people retreat and they're like, I just need to like grieve alone. That's kind of how I do. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, I need to be by myself and figure this out. I can't relive this every single day. Maybe you get to that point, but you know, not right away. But she has said she doesn't think Jason and Shirley were involved. She doesn't agree with what her ex-husband is accusing them of. She's she's fine. For you it. know, she thinks sue Shirley him. has every right to sue him. And also she's spoken to that she hates that these things have become this like three ring circus around her daughter's case. You know, they're just trying to grieve and there's all this other stuff that gets thrown in now. No, you're right. That quote from her on Capitol Daily, where I believe she was saying that people treated her daughter's murder like a game. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's got to be so hard that you see not only that, but you see this website of, you know, your your daughter's father is uh, at least involved in some of the mayhem, if not partially contributing to it, if, according to police allegations. So it's probably hard that you yourself want just as just as much as your ex. Oh, yeah. But going about it in a much less hope damaging way. Yeah, you they're definitely going about it in in two different ways. Capital Daily released its podcast Murder on the Island in January of 2023 to dispel rumors and cut through disinformation on the case. 
utilizing the trove of records it received, as well as firsthand interviews from those involved. Still, misinformation on the case abounds. Anyone with information on the murder of Lindsay Buziak is urged to contact the Saanich Police at 1-888-980-1919 or tips at sanichpolice.ca. You can also contact Greater Victoria Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or 1-800-222-8477. You can also submit a tip online at victoriacrimestoppers.com. So what do we think? Well, there's several theories that the internet has uh, taken and run with. One of them is frequently, oh, the boyfriend did it. That's the very first theory. I don't think that is likely, that he was the perpetrator, much less the uh, mastermind architect behind it. I say that because... They've had 15 years. They also had access to his laptop, access to his cell phone data, access to his DNA. He was seen with somebody else. Now, if his involvement was somebody or something and Lindsay being his girlfriend and that caused something to happen to her, that might be okay. I have not seen evidence of him having sufficient motive to murder her, to orchestrate the brutal and violent murder. There's no means to this end. If your relationship wasn't going well, break up with someone. But that doesn't always happen, though. We've seen domestic violence cases a lot where you could just break up with someone, but they kill them. No, certainly. I just mean in this case, the extreme planning, buying a cell phone three months beforehand. No, I don't think he he I don't think he obviously he didn't kill her. He was he had as an alibi. Yes, Uh, I'm not saying that he is completely not involved, but I don't. I can't say that he is involved either. Yeah, there's a, the police have cleared him, but we don't, I mean, whatever evidence there may be, it hasn't been made public. If there is evidence to connect him to it. Yeah, and I, if they do have nothing to do with it and they're still, their names are getting dragged through the mud, that certainly does suck. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why you see somebody for defamation and then what would happen is in court is, if there is any evidence that they're involved, maybe we'll see that in the defamation trial of Jeff True. and the website commenter saying, listen, this is why we said what we said. And if Jeff had worked with a private investigator previously, he may have documents, evidence, proof that we're just not privy to. And maybe the police either are privy to but haven't made public or if he hasn't shared that with them because, you know, they they stopped getting along. Well, they have a more strained relationship, it seems, just by based on interviews. So if Jeff has something and it's going to come out in the defamation trial, then that would be a fine time for it to come out, given that that's a defense. The truth is a defense to being sued for that. I would argue that that would be a reason why Jason and Shirley are not involved, because if you know that something could come out in court, I don't think you're going to go forward with the defamation case because you don't want to take the chance. I would absolutely agree with that. And it's uh, funny you say that because some commenters on the Jeff Buziak website and there are some other kind of more fringe blogs have been like, if it really wasn't Shirley Zalo, then why haven't any of us been sued for defamation? And there's the answer to your question is you are now being sued for defamation. So you're right. I thought that does go to if they really were involved, what? how many people, if it is such a conspiracy that some of the websites say, oh, Shirley Zalo has every police officer in her pocket. It's like when you get the United States FBI involved, you get the RCMP involved, the Sandwich PD, and now you're having civil, There is there her attorney is going to get involved. You know, you're going to have Jeff's attorneys. There's a judge. There's pe- At what point do you think that the... the- she's just a real estate agent. She's not a, the, you know, she's not a kingpin. No. She tried to buy and sell houses. Mm -hmm. And if she is some sort of a kingpin, then the police should know about that or they already do know about that. But yeah, it just gets to a point where some of these fringe theories are just so outlandish that you're like, where do you think this ends? I think it's people assume a lot of the time, like you said, it's the boyfriend, it's the husband, it's the whole like trope. I think usually it is somebody that's a little more obvious, but in this case, I think the most outlandish scenario is probably the one that's actually happened. Yeah. I think that this is some kind of like a hired hit, but uh, someone 
emailed us a listener and thank you who asked to remain anonymous, but made a good point that like mob hits traditionally are you get in, you get out. It's, it's a gun to the head or something. You know what I mean? Quick, quick and silent. This is more of a message, something that is gory, 40 stab. I mean, stabbing period is a, you know, a very like, intimate crime that you have to be up close to somebody like that so it seems like more of a message almost what is the message though was jason involved in something and somebody was trying to get to him was she just accidentally uh talked to one of her friends that's in one of these cartels and got the finger pointed at her like for for no reason at all or a case of misidentification i don't think it's that because it was very planned and they had her number and knew what she looked like i don't think it's like it they misidentified anyone i think they knew who they were killing and they were hired to kill her specifically but i think the reason that she was killed was she didn't have anything to do with anything unsavory Right. I think you're right that they did pick her. They obviously and the police have said that. And based on it was her personal cell phone number. But you're right. I wonder if uh, what the the theory that the police started floating in 2019 is that she was mistaken for someone else that the whoever hired the professional, the professionals that did this thought, oh, it was Lindsay Buziak who did this thing. And it happened to not be her. But they pointed a finger at her and said, Mm. or she was dating a person or involved in something or did a real estate transaction for somebody. She had some relation of, Oh, well, we'll let's make a, we'll make a, uh, an example out of you or send a message out of you. Cause I think that email was based in some personal knowledge and experience with organized crime and the variations on whether something is more of just a hit because the person needs to be gone and not talk or the message of this will happen to you if mm-hmm. you're not careful. And that maybe that's why the police keep asking somebody knows somebody knows somebody knows and that reasonable group that is still in Saanich Victoria that's still in the island area they keep asking for them to say something because maybe the the group is not the ones that did it but the group knows why and we're involved in something and is like well we don't want to be involved in that anymore and none of us want to talk about it so it's a cone of silence if nobody talks then we're all gonna none of us will get arrested and even though the the I don't say five of them, but the however many handful of those who do know what happened are keeping tight lip because they know if one of them goes, they're all going to go not for being the actual murderers, but being the cause of it, not because they ordered it, but because they were involved in something they shouldn't have been and fucked up. So what do you think was what do you think she saw something? I mean, her dad said when she visited me in Calgary, she wrote a letter saying that she witnessed something she shouldn't have. That letter has never been turned in as evidence or or shown up. He did say she also, you know, talked to him about it. So if she did see something she shouldn't have, what do you think it was? I imagine it would have to have been something drug related. I don't have any other. There's been no indication of any other type of larger criminal enterprise that would have access to or relationships with a professional hitman, like a professional killer who's going to do something like this. So I would assume it had something to do with either an acquaintance she had through Facebook, it sounds like. Or somebody wrote something on her wall about being at a place or meeting at a place or something. But if what the police said that those deleted wall messages hold the key to her killer, it may be that whoever deleted those messages knew that, knew they could be identified with it and thought, well, I better delete these before the cops get a hold of them. Hmm. You can't delete anything, though, is the real secret. But, yeah, I think whatever she saw was a business deal or something that high stakes, a lot of money, high stakes. You don't get you don't get murdered in this vicious fashion or have this message or if she didn't hear or see anything and just someone she was associated with wronged someone and like our listener said it was more of a message of a killing and we talked in the last episode about you know when she was in calgary she tried to or she we don't know if she tried to meet up with her high school friend but at the very least there were some messages back and forth who was later busted in the huge drug heist Mm -hmm. in calgary if she did end up meeting up with him and she saw 
something she shouldn't have or or somebody thought she saw something she shouldn't have is all that really matters. You know, I think she had no idea until she was got this call for this weird showing and had a weird feeling that she was on anybody's radar for uh, something nefarious like this. No, I agree, because I don't think she would have gone, much less gone alone, if she was like, I really need to look, watch over my back after that weird incident yeah. we had. Whatever. It's just, it seemed like she was operating on normal procedure yeah. and then just got kind of a weird call. Yeah, that's a good point, though, that maybe it was something she didn't even know somebody was involved in, and she was closely associated with them. Friends, dating, colleagues, yeah. formerly dating, you know, whatever, talking to online, whatever. It sounds like she had some tangential relationship to a larger criminal enterprise that mm -hmm. is taking a lot of government agencies to try to unwind. Yeah, which is, I think that could also be telling mm -hmm. when you've got the RCMP, the FBI, multiple yeah. police departments. I'm not saying they are hiding something, but I'll never say that the government is not capable of hiding something. If it benefits somebody else in a way to yeah. not give up who did this because they are an informant or they are involved with a huge cartel that people do business with, I mean... To them, it's just like a casualty they they don't care about, you know, to others, it's their daughter and they're going to, I mean, he said, Jeff said, I, I will die mm -hmm. finding out who my daughter's murderer is. If, you know, if it hasn't been found out by that time, I can guarantee you that my last breath will be trying to find out who did this. And I hope that for his sake and uh, ton of other people that that's the case there's a reason this is one of the more discussed cases in in true crime it happened in such a place where things like this don't happen and it was such an egregious crime for a, ostensibly none no reason she was just a, a victim and no one knows why and these are the type of crimes that it's hard to these are the ones that uh stay with us people always ask what what are, you know, the cases that you think about a lot? And it's stuff like this because we, we as humans want an ending. We want a resolution and when you don't mm -hmm. have it, it makes you feel unsettled. Oh, definitely. And Jeff Buziak even said, well, it sort of sends the message that, hey, in Sanitz, you could commit murder and you might not even yeah. get arrested for it. And I don't think that's an overstatement. Granted, I'm sure it came from a place of extreme pain. But you're right in saying that if it's extremely sad if you have a situation where it's like, well, yes, she was killed, but we really can't identify this person because they have this information. Or if we do, it's going to ruin this investigation that we've had going on for all these years. And that is going to dictate the timeline of when any information is going to be released. It's just going to be. Or if, if it the, is. Yeah. Or if, if ever, you're right. And. That's your and also you're right that the government is hiding stuff because Capital Daily got a bunch of documents and even the documents they got were all partially redacted. So what that tells me is there is information that and, and with the in camera hearing with the judge, like there is there's something bigger to this case. And it's not as easy as, oh, just the boyfriend did it. Oh, just his mom no, did it. No, no. Oh, I don't it's think just this, that it's so did easy. do it. No, it's silly. No, and, and I don't think so. If, like I said, if he was involved with something and that was a connection to a connection that caused her to get whatever, I, we don't have any evidence or information. But right now, it seems, based on the evidence that we have, that the police say they know who owned the phone. Do you think Jason Zalo owned the phone and they're just not arresting him? No, it's a ludicrous right. thing to say. They know who owned the phone. They just can't arrest that person. And the question is, what reason? And we don't know. Yeah. No, you're right. What you said earlier, we this is the type that leaves us all feeling very unsettled. And hopefully that unsettled feeling will lead to someone in Saanich and Victoria with any shred of information to come forward to the Victoria Crime yeah. Stoppers and tell them. Yeah, no information is too small. For real. So, yeah, we'd love to be able to do an update on this soon that someone has been caught in. It's don't give up hope if you are her family, because I I always think about Kristen Smart's case yes. when with cases like this. 
it mm-hmm. could take decades and that sucks and that should never be the case. However, it could take decades to finally for someone to care enough for a case to get busted wide open. So I hope that's yeah. the case with this one too. Me too. We love providing Sinister Hood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. Patreon also has a new feature that's the join for free option, and we have opted into that. So you can join our Patreon for free. You'll get updates, information on when things have been released. So you can decide if you want to join or not. If you're just curious about what we've got going on or want to keep in touch with us and and get our latest updates, you can just go to our Patreon and hit join for free. So you're in the know. And as a thank you for joining our full-fledged Patreon, you'll get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and like we said in this episode, May's mini-sode is about uh, Siri and Alexa ratting on people, so digital evidence in the courtroom and cases that came from that. We also have weekly audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and and more and our patrons in the getting into it tier are also able to vote on a bonus content segment each quarter that they would like to see us live stream join now because our next live stream will be in june they also get to vote on a episode that will be released on the main feed and Lindsay's case was the one that they voted on thank you all for voting you also have the fun perk of access to our discord server where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. This month's is the 24th at 8 p.m. Central. For our patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. You also got to go to Sinisterhood.com slash live shows for information on all of our upcoming live shows. We're on tour right now with our Full Moon Energy Tour. We're headed off to the West Coast in just a couple weeks. We are. We're going to be in San Francisco on June 7th and Los Angeles on June 9th. And then after that, we're going to be in New York. We're going to Washington, D.C. We're going to Boston, Detroit, Pittsburgh. We're going to be all over the place and not in that order. I'll tell you that much. But if you go to (laughs) Sinisterhood.com slash live shows, you will see all the shows in order. You'll get links to buy your tickets. And in a few cities, I think actually only maybe one of the cities, there's still VIP tickets, but there are still tickets available, although they are going fast. A couple of them, well, get them now. Get them now. Don't wait. At sinisterhood.com slash live shows. Yeah. That LA show is almost sold out. And also, no cow. We got some counts today. You've come up a bit. But Thank in the you, no Santa. cow, so cow uh, battle that we've created, yes. so cow is still in the lead. So if you're a Northern California person, get it now because- We assume that you're always trying to stick it to the Southern California people, and this is the best way. I hope there's really a San Francisco LA rivalry and we didn't just make it up because Dallas and Houston beef. And then we were like, it must be the same. It's just the same. (laughs) But also, anytime Dallas and Houston is brought up, I'm like, I don't, we're all, who cares? (laughs) Yeah, we're all in the same, we're we're marooned on the same horrible island together. We're we're all in the same ship boat together so yeah. just grab a paddle help your neighbor out and and go to sinisterhood.com slash live shows and get your tickets and you can also go to our website and our live shows to get some merch mm-hmm. we have got some cool swag like t-shirts mugs totes and even clothes for your kiddos and this month through the end of may we're donating uh, our 100 percent of our proceeds on our website to the allen outlet mall shooting victims first fund it is a 100 pro bono no admin fee it's organized by other survivors of mass shootings and 100 percent of the proceeds go directly to the victims so that is on sinister and click on shop and we also have a link in on our 
shop that will take you to the donation page if you just want to donate directly. We'll make that easy for you. You can support the show fast, easy, and at no cost to you by rating, reviewing, and following on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Speaking of reviews, you can easily leave one by going to SinisterHood.com slash reviews. Yours may even be featured on our social media. If you have a friend who you think would like us, you can easily share any episode with them by clicking the three dots in the top right corner. You can also share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting SinisterHood.com slash playlists. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We're on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. We're also on Cameo at Sinisterhood. You can search us on there if you want us to send a personalized video shout out to somebody in your life and have us tell them happy birthday, happy anniversary, congratulations, any message. We will personalize it and we are very happy to do them. We love to do them. And it can be uh, for any event, holiday, whatever you want us to say, we will say it at Cameo.com. Christy, where are you at online? I'm on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and Twitter and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world, TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Aaron Braun. Marinara. Leanna Weeks. Susan Garinsher. Bambi Crusoe. Kylie Carrier. Kaylin Horseman Best. Samantha Kim. Isabel Camacho. And Pam Storm. Sounds like a superhero. I Fuck love yeah. it. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. We hope we pronounced everyone's names correctly. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Wah-ha-ha. Sinister.